Hello again, it's good to be back with you. I do a lot of work with using music and musical instruments to try to interest students in math, science, and engineering. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about that now. One of the interesting things about music is that there's an underlying mathematical pattern, and that mathematical pattern is easy to understand. So I thought I'd tell you about that, show you how that works. Now, musical notes are named with letters. Now, we could have named them anything. We could have given them names of people or colors or something, but for historical reasons, I suppose, they are, known, they are given the names of letters. So it goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then circles back around to A, B, C again, and, and the pattern repeats itself. Now, so I started here at C, so C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. I got through one cycle there. And also to the sides here, I wrote some other notes. Okay, here's C sharp, D sharp, F sharp, G sharp, and A sharp. That little checkerboard sign there means sharp. It means we've raised the pitch a little bit. Um, there's also things called flats that have a little, looks kind of like a superscript B, and that means we've lowered the pitch a little bit. So C sharp and D flat are the same note. Now, just to keep things simple, I'm going to get rid of the flats here. Now, these clearly exist, and there's some scales that have flats in them. Um, but for right now, let's just, let's just look at the sharps. It doesn't really change the underlying principle at all. Okay? Now, for this to really make sense, we have to have a frequency or pitch assigned to each note. That means every note has to have a very specific number associated with it that tells you how many cycles per second you're dealing with. Now, something you might not have known. There are actually different ways of doing this. There is actually more than one kind of pattern available or that's used to find pitches of notes. And they're not all the same, okay? And it's called temperament. Right? That's, that's the, the, the name given to these slightly different ways of defining notes. You might know of a classical piece called the well-tempered clavier. Clavier is just the German word for piano. Well-tempering is one of those, those schemes. All right? One of the most popular ones now, and the one used in guitars, here's one of my guitars here, okay, is called equal-tempering. Right? And equal tempering is what makes it easy to lay this neck out. That's what I'm going to tell you about right now. I don't know if it's the most commonly used uh, uh, tempering scheme. It's one of the most commonly used, and it's used on essentially all fret and stringed instruments. So banjos and guitars and ukuleles and mandolins and that kind of thing pretty much all use equal tempering. So here's the deal. Music is defined in terms of frequency ratios, okay? So let's say we knew the frequency of that note right there. Okay, we'll just call it F0. I don't know what it is. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is. We'll find out later. Um, but for the sake of figuring out the pattern, we'll just call that F0, right? So this note here, we'll call that the zero note, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. There's 12 possible notes between C and the next C. The pitch is increasing on the way down here. Okay? Now, we only use eight of them to make a scale. That's what the word octave okay, comes from the word eight. We obviously don't use all 12. We use eight of them. And I'll tell you about that in another video. Okay, so let's say that note right there, the pitch, the frequency, the number of times per second maybe a string oscillates or an air column vibrates, called F1, and it turns out that the ratio of F1 to F0 is some number. We'll just call that number R. I don't, don't know what it is. We'll figure it out later. Okay? So this one over here is F2 and son of a gun. It has the same relationship with the note above it. Okay? It has that exact same ratio. Its frequency divided by the frequency of the note that precedes it, of the, of the next lower pitch, is also R. Well, but that means it's R times R times F0, or R squared F0. Okay? So F2 is R squared F0. Okay. Well, F3, guess what F3 is? F3 over F2 is also R, and that means it's R cubed times F0, and so on. So we carry this pattern down, and F12 is R12 F0. Or F12 over F0 equals R to the 12th power. 
okay, now this sounds pretty obscure. R to the 12th power, what, what do I do with this? There's one other bit of information that makes this useful. Okay? When I go from a note all the way through this series of 12 possible notes to the next one with the same name, right, the pitch doubles. Okay? So an octave corresponds to a doubling of pitch. see this. Oh good, I got that in the frame. Alright, so we know that F12 over F0, which is this frequency divided by that frequency, is R to the 12th power. But we also know now it's a doubling of frequency, so R to the 12th power equals 2. Well, if R to the 12th power equals 2, now we can figure out what R is. See that little thing right there? That's an equation. One equation, one unknown. Bet I can solve that. So R equals the 12th root of 2. Now that's a strange number, okay? That's not something you would have expected, perhaps. It's certainly not something I expected. When you work this out, you get 1.0595. It actually goes out farther than that, but that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 significant figures. That's plenty, all right? So if I want to know F1, I multiply F0 by that number right there. If I want to know F2, I multiply that number by that number squared, and so on. Okay, so we've got, got everything defined in terms of R and F0, and we know what R is. There's only one problem here. What's F0? We've figured it out so that if we know what any note in the scale is, we can f calculate all the others. Well, how do we know that note? Well, it turns out, let's see, how am I going to do this? Well, it turns out that, let me get rid of all that stuff too, that one of the A notes, the A note in the middle of the scale, which is actually called A sub 4, all right, is defined by an international standard, an ISO standard, and by international agreement, I'm going to write that down because it's so important. A4 equals 440 hertz. Okay? That's, there's an actual international standard that says A4, which might be that one, is 440 hertz. Now that you know what that is, you can calculate all the rest in the human hearing range. And the human he hearing range goes nominally from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. All right? So there's quite a few octaves within the human hearing range. little historical note. Before there was electronics, how did we know what 440 hertz was? Think about it. If you want to count something happening 440 times a second, can you do that mechanically? Oh, well, maybe. What it really turned out, though, is that concert masters all had their own tuning forks. And their, their tuning fork was set to A4. And they had their orchestras tuned to that, that uh, value. And A4 was whatever that tuning fork said it was. Nobody calibrated them. Nobody had the means to calibrate them. And also, as, as time went on, people found out that they liked slightly higher pitches. So over time, A4 drifted upwards. Now, we don't really have any way of knowing what A4 really was, but the historians think that A4 in some orchestras might have been as low as 420 hertz. And over time, it might have drifted as high as 460 hertz. Well, that means that no two orchestras sound exactly alike because they're all tuned differently. We don't have that problem anymore. With electronics and an international standard, we know 440 hertz is A4 and it'll probably never change. And if we know that and we're using equal tempering, we have a mathematical arrangement, a mathematical pattern that allows us to calculate all the notes. That's it for this time. I'll see you next.